So we're going to continue with our data set of the week, which is this credit card fraud detection data set. And for today, unlike yesterday, uh, unlike Tuesday, I'm just going to take one tenth of the data um, and Otherwise, the code would be too slow. Some of the code today is already pretty slow, even with the smaller data set. But the data set was pretty big. So even after taking one tenth, um, I have 21,000. I should say this is slightly sloppy in the sense that if I subsample and then take train test split, some of the things in our test set today may have been in the training set on Tuesday. And so I guess I should have done the exact same train test split as we did on Tuesday and then sampled each one by 10%. And that would have been a bit better. Um, but there you have it. Okay. Um, yes, yeah, so many ways to violate the golden rule. It's hard to believe. All right. Uh, so here's our thing from last time. It's uh, logistic regression. We talked about this class weight thing. I'm, I'm we're not going to worry too much about this today. Um, and I need a scoring method for today. I'm just going to use this average precision score. Um, We'll just say for today, that's the score we're interested in, uh, but it could be ROC, it could be, I mean, ROC, AUC, area under the curve, it could be accuracy, it could be F1 score. Um, I just thought this was a reasonable score to pick for today. Um, and I'm going to get the cross-validation score of average precision of our logistic regression pipeline. And I think we probably saw a score similar to this last time. Um, and now we're going to talk about some other classifiers. So here's a decision tree. Um, and the decision tree, because we didn't specify a max depth, crazy overfits as usual, it makes a super deep tree. And the average precision on the validation is pretty bad, a lot worse than logistic regression, which makes sense because decision trees are not really that great. However, while decision trees are not really that great, why did I even tell you about them? Because there's a whole bunch of classifiers that are based on decision trees that are fancy versions of decision trees. And those ones are actually pretty good. And so I'm going to introduce you to a few of those today. Um, and so one of them is called the random forest and random forest is basically a bunch of decision trees um, that get averaged together. And one of the topics for later today is what do I mean by average together? So uh, we'll definitely get to that by the end of class today, but uh, this is a bunch of decision trees that get combined in some way. That's what we'll call it for now. Um, it has the word random in the name. So there is some randomness. Each decision tree that gets made, there's some randomness in its creation. And so here I'm setting the random state, not just for train test split, but actually for the random force classifier itself, because the classifier itself has randomness. And I want you following along to have the same results as me. So that's why I'm fixing the random state here. Uh, and here I'm not making a pipeline because uh, these tree based methods don't need scaling. Um, and so I'm just not bothering with scaling, although I should think carefully about it. That's probably true for all the ones I'm going to show you today. But of course, you could have this in a pipeline if you wanted and have scaling. And I don't see any harm in doing that. So how does the random forest do? We're, our, Competition is 70%. Um, um, average precision score, decision tree was 0.32. And the random forest is getting uh, 72. So this is a little better than logistic regression. So that's cool. And we haven't even tuned the hyperparameters, I should say. I mean, this is clearly overfitting. We may want to tone down the hyperparameters here to make it overfit less. And when we do that, we might actually get an even better cross-validation score. Um, but this is cool. We tried something else and we did a little better. Um, and so let me just put everything into a data frame. Uh, so here's the results. You can see that the random force was also slower and we experienced that in that we had to wait a bit longer. Um, so it's about 10 times slower to fit than logistic regression. Interestingly, the hyperparameters actually affect the time, and we'll talk about that in a second. Um, and yeah, the test score was a little higher, um, and this one was overfitting, and this one was really not overfitting. So actually, for logistic regression, increasing C, the complexity parameter, might actually get you a better test score because we're practically not even overfitting at all here, and it might be worth cranking it up and getting a bit of that fundamental trade-off, and, and it, it might make the logistic regression better. 
So, um, well, actually, um, this I, I want to add a, a Q and A here. Um, so I'm just looking in the chat. Uh, this seems like a really high score for something that is so clearly overfitted. Yeah, you know, again, it's 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 a trade off. Um, things that overfit can still do well. It's just um, it, it just means the trade off seemed to be worth making. But maybe if you crank down the complexity of this by changing the hyperparameters and got the train score a bit lower, maybe this would go up. But honestly, maybe it wouldn't. We can't really predict how the trade-off behaves. Uh, but yes, we should, I like that we're looking at this and just keeping in mind, okay, if we're gonna wanna use this, let's, let's keep our eyes open and say, hey, we're using a complex model that's overfitting. And so if there are other warning signs, um, we, should, we should be careful about that. We should look at the test error uh, and all that kind of stuff. Is a random forest as deep as the decision tree? Great question. We'll talk about that in a second. Okay, so random forests are um, a collection of decision trees. Each tree basically votes. Um, so I think there's like 100 decision trees uh, by default and each one votes and it basically takes the majority vote to decide how to predict. Um, but the thing is that each tree is kind of limited. It's not a full on decision tree like we saw before. Um, it doesn't get to look at all the columns of the original data set. Uh, and it also looks at a slightly different version of the original data set. And the goal of that is to have some diversity in the trees. Um, because when you have things that are voting, if they're a bit more different from each other, it does better. And we'll talk about that in about half an hour, why that is. Um, I, what I wanted to show you first is I can make a random forest. So yes, the, the random forest has a max depth hyperparameter just like decision tree. And that sets the depth of each individual tree in the forest. And it also has an N estimators, which says how many decision trees are there. So here, just for illustration purposes, I have three decision trees, each with a depth of two. I'm fitting it and then I'm calling my display tree function. Um, and so we can actually look inside of the random forest. So. Uh, V11, these are just the names of the features. They had kind of an interesting names. So here's one of the decision trees. Um, it's saying, well, well, you can look at the tree. It's looking at these three features. Um, and if, if they were just regular decision trees, all three would be exactly the same because they're looking at the same data set, but random forest has this randomness to it uh, that makes each tree different. And so here you got a different tree. You can see it's looking at different features. Uh, and here's the third tree. You can see it's looking at different features again. Uh, and these three trees are being combined and that's the little random forest. So um, it is really just a bunch of decision trees uh, being combined. Um, and let me, let me delay this question period for a minute um, to at least here. Um, and so there's some hyperparameters. So we, as always, we can look at the documentation. You can go there in your browser or you can just look at it right here in Jupyter. So n estimators equals 100. So by default, it's making 100 decision trees. By default, it's making them very deep. Um, and so this is, is another, uh, so let me say this. Um, this hyperparameter, it, it, when it's bigger, it's more complexity. If you have lots and lots and lots of trees, um, you have more complexity, you will be able to get a better training score. The max depth, you already know that hyperparameter. You already know that the bigger it is, that's more complexity. So as you make max depth bigger, you can also expect a lower training error. Uh, this third hyperparameter that I want to draw your attention to is max features. So it turns out as these decision trees are splitting, they, they don't get to look at all the columns of the data set. And I'm not going to go into the details, but um, basically, you can choose how many features does it get to look at. So if you have 100 features, does it get to pick its favorite out of 10 randomly selected, or does it get to pick its favorite out of 50 randomly selected? And so that's what this hyperparameter does. And it is also the bigger it is, the more complexity, uh, because the tree has more options to choose from, and it's going to get a lower training error. So uh, there's more hyperparameters here, as you can see. Um, and uh, I, th I think these are kind of important ones. 
just keep in mind that while each tree and each split isn't looking at all the features, when you have lots of splits and lots of trees, you, you can eventually look at all the features. Um, so it's kind of a local limitation, but at the end of the day, your whole random forest will probably be looking at all the features. And well, in this particular case, it wasn't because it was such a tiny random forest, but if you look at the default hyperparameters with a hundred trees and max depth, um, I didn't want to visualize that because it'll be giant, but it will look at all the features. Okay, so now we can go to Q&A. Um, how do you know if all the features are being taken into account? Yeah, um, um, actually, that will be a perfect question for next class. Um, because next class, we're going to talk about feature importances, which is after you fit a model, you can do some analysis to see how each feature is contributing. So just hold on to that question for uh, one more class. Why do some decision nodes have class zero in both true and false case? Yeah. Um, we touched briefly on that in lecture two. It's a good question. Uh, basically, it is useless to do this split, but the decision tree algorithm actually doesn't know that this is going to be the last split. And so looking at V10 less than negative four is actually useful um, if you were going to split more. Um, but, but we just cut it off at a depth of two, and so it is useless in this case. But if we were going to allow more depth, it would split more and become useful again. When would we need to specify the number of estimators? Um, it's just a hyperparameter, just like any other. So you can throw it into randomized search CV, for example. Uh, wouldn't it be possible, even the slightest, that not all the features are used? Yeah, it would be possible. Um, just not that likely in a big random forest. Uh, do we need to prune the trees? Um, not really, the decision tree algorithm kind of takes care of that. Um, I feel like someone's going to throw a tomato at me if I say C, CPSC 340, but it is worth saying that in that course, we'll go into more about the decision tree algorithm in the random forests. Um, so it's just splitting the features and decide on the outcome. Um, yeah, so let me get a bit later in today about how it combines the predictions from the three trees. If n estimators is one and max features is one, that means you'll only have one tree and that'll just look at one feature. Uh, not necessarily. So if max features is one, that means each split only gets one feature to choose from. So in other words, it doesn't actually have a choice. Um, but then the next split, so this one will only be allowed to choose V9 and so it'll just use V9 and this one will only be allowed to choose V10. Uh, so it will still look at different features and you can try that out yourself. After class on Tuesday, you can make a random forest, set max features to one, use the tools we're going to talk about on Tuesday, and you will hopefully see that it's actually using more than one feature. Um, yeah, these are really good questions. So uh, there's some other tree-based classifiers that I want to talk about uh, that are more fancy in the sense that the algorithms are more complicated. And we have to actually leave the world of scikit-learn to get implementations of them. Um, although actually, I think now that I think about it, scikit-learn does have something of this flavor. I should, I should bring that in. Scikit-learn doesn't have these specific ones, but scikit-learn, what is it called? My gradient boost tree or, yeah, I'll, I'll check that later. In any case, these are our open source packages. Uh, you can look these things up and you can see the code on GitHub. You can see the documentation, but they're not scikit-learn. But people have made scikit-learn friendly wrappers so that it feels, other than installing the package, which, use, uh, which you've already done, um, it basically feels like scikit-learn. And so it has fit, it has predict, predict prova score. And so we can kind of ignore the fact that they come from outside scikit-learn. Uh, they're pretty compatible with most of the things we want to do. Um, yeah, and I, yeah, the probability scores um, come from the variation across different trees. So all these three things, uh, XGBoost, LightGBM, and CatBoost, uh, these are pretty recent. Like, I think some of these were made in the last few years, um, and they're really popular. I see a lot of people having a lot of success 
And what are these things? They're basically just fancier versions of random forests. Um, and it's outside of the scope of the course to go into what they are, but you can just think of them as fancy random forests. And at the end of the day, they're, they're a bunch of trees. Um, and so I'm just going to see how well they do. Um, okay, yeah, you know, this is actually kind of a detail that we don't need to talk about right now. But basically, I'm just having a, a dictionary of all the things we want to try. We want to try the three things we already talked about. And then I'm making these new ones, XGBoost classifier, LightGBM classifier, and CatBoost classifier. And I have set the hyperparameters to try to kind of match them with all the stuff we're doing. Uh, but I don't want to go into too much detail about the hyperparameters right now. Uh, but these all have documentation that you can look at. Um, but each one of these does have a hyperparameter that's basically like number of trees. And I'm just using the defaults here for now. So um, here's what I'm going to do. And this is going to take a few minutes to run. I'm looping through these six classifiers. And for each one, it's, I'm printing it out while it's running. So it's currently working on the random forest. I'm doing cross validation using my scoring method we talked about um, getting the training error. I'm taking the mean across the five folds because five folds is default. And I'm putting them all in a results dictionary, which we're then going to print out at the end. Uh, and cat boost is the slowest. And I, I should actually check. I have a feeling it might be just that it uses more trees by default, in which case it's kind of unfair to compare them um, because we're, we're not really using comparable hyper. A, a real comparison of this, right now I'm just using default hyperparameters, but a real comparison of this, we would do like a randomized search CV on each of these to try to find good hyperparameters for each of these. And then we would see which one is best. And that would be a more realistic comparison than what we're doing now, which is faster and just looking at the default hyperparameters, because now we're not just measuring which one is the best, but also which one has the best defaults, which is less important. Um, that's funny. Um, so here we see random forest and cat boost being the best. I thought I set all the random seeds, and yet when I ran this yesterday, uh, cat boost was a bit better than random forest. So it must be that I failed to actually set all the random seeds and that the results are actually still a little bit different every time. Um, so we, sh we should figure that out. Uh, but definitely all of these have some randomness in them and you should be able to set the random seeds so that uh, you get the same results every time. So there's so much interesting to look at here. First of all, all these tree-based models are massively overfitting by default. And you'll have to change the hyperparameters away from default if you don't want that to happen. Um, but as someone was saying in the chat before, maybe that's OK. I mean, if this overfitting tree gets us the best cross-validation score, and we have a big data set, and all the folds of cross-validation are agreeing with each other, and the test error is agreeing, it might be OK to just stick with this model that's massively overfitting. Um, there's maybe a little bit to worry about, but it, it could be totally fine. Um, it's also really interesting to look at the time. So look at how cat boost was so much slower than everything else. Uh, it takes about 10 seconds to fit for one fold of cross validation, whereas you know logistic regression is taking 0.2 seconds. Um, random forest is taking two seconds. It's also interesting to note that um, the score time is always much faster than the fit time, and that's just very typical across almost all of machine learning. Uh, with a couple of exceptions that we'll talk about later in the course. Usually fitting is what takes a long time and predict um, is super fast and score is basically just calling predict. Um, yeah, so in this case, random forest seems to be, seems to be the winner. Um, I think it's often good to try uh, at least one of these. If you're, if you're working on a, a problem, um, like past the course, I think these things one of them, if not all of them, are worth trying. Because just anecdotally, I hear that a lot of people get a lot of success with these things. And um, if you just take a random person who's doing machine learning for a living uh, or as part of the job, I would say there's a good chance they're using one of these four things at the top here. Um, they're, they're very popular and very effective. OK, so my thoughts on the above, I think we already talked about it. But yeah, keep in mind, this isn't really a fair comparison. I'm using default hyperparameters. I'm using particular scoring metric. 
uh, average precision score. This is all five-fold CV. Everything's totally overfit. We talked about the times um, and all that kind of stuff. Okay, so which classifier should I use? Because um, I just think someone might be wondering that. So the cop-out answer is, well, whichever gets the highest CV score. Um, that is, again, that's okay if there's no other warning signs. If the data set's big, the folds of cross-validation agree with each other, that one's also good on the test set. Um, but yeah, there's a lot more you might need to think about than just which one gets the highest CV score. So for example, interpretability. Again, on Tuesday, we're gonna talk about digging a little more into these things. How do they work? Why do they make the predictions they make? Which features are they using most? Um, and so something like logistic regression is kind of the most interpretable. It's simple, which means we can understand how it works, but also it might be too simple. Um, so there are pros and cons. And in general, interpretability is like one of the big hot areas in machine learning because everyone's like, oh my goodness, we have no clue why any of this works and it's going to like ruin our lives and we need to, we need to learn more about this. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about ethics uh, later in the course as well. Um, so other considerations are speed, maintainability of the code. So if, if you know, the people who made Cat Boost just decide, you know, we're quitting and then the package is not getting maintained anymore, then you probably don't want to use it because your company or your organization in three years will upgrade to the newer version of Python and then it won't work anymore and blah, blah, blah. Like there's definitely other factors here, more human factors than just cross-validation score. Um, how fast is the code? How easy is the code to understand? Is it being actively maintained by a community? Is it open source? Is it from a company? Um, but finally, another thing you could do is say, you know what, I'm not going to choose the best one. I'm just going to use all of them. Uh, and that's what we're going to talk about for the rest of today is, so within a random forest, within an XG boost, it's combining a bunch of decision trees, true. but zooming out from that you can just combine whatever classifiers you want you can combine logistic regression with random forest uh, and that's what we're going to be talking about for the rest of today and that's called ensemble methods any questions about that uh yeah go for it raised hand hey mike um so i have a question um that is somewhat related um, so what if your data is pretty skewed, like you could only get like your data is like 75%, you know, X and is true and uh, for the other 25%, you know, it's, it's false or like how do you, you talk like, about the class imbalance that we talked about last class? Yeah, like, there's I'm a lot of not frauds and very few frauds. Yeah, so you know, when you do the random forest and especially like the uh, cross validation, like how do you make sure that in your cross validation, like you're not getting a crazy amount of, you know, like all of them are, are, you know, not frauds yep. in, in like yep. four of your folds. And then in the totally. last fold, it's like all fraud. Totally. That's a great question. So, um, one thing that I just kind of snuck in at the beginning here is I just picked a scoring method. Um, if I didn't set this, if I just took this out everywhere, it would be using the default dot score, uh, which is going to be accuracy. And we talked last time about how, you know what, maybe accuracy doesn't make sense because you can actually do pretty well by just saying everything is not a fraud and get 99.9 .9 or what, 98% accuracy. Um, so I have tried to mitigate this issue you asked about by picking this other scoring method, average precision, that looks at the output of predict prova and kind of considers what different precisions you get at different recalls and tries to average it and like summarize the behavior of it. But you're right that, I mean, this is just a particular scoring metric that's gonna prefer a particular approach. And when you're done all this, it would be a great idea to make a confusion matrix and really look at what it's predicting um, in the different folds of cross-validation or on your test set, just to remind yourself okay, I tried to pick a scoring method that would prefer things that kind of did well on a task that I was interested in rather than just accuracy, but that doesn't mean it's going to be perfect. It's just some weird mathy thing that uses the outputs of predict probo. We don't have a super strong intuition of exactly what it's preferring. So that's an excellent point that 
And I feel like with this course, we're kind of building up a list of things to be worried about. In a way, that's the entire point of this whole course, is I want you to know what to worry about, um, because that's a lot of what goes wrong in machine learning, is people don't worry enough. Um, and so this is another thing to add to your list. If it's classification, which is what we're doing now, um, if, if there's an imbalance situation or a situation where you care about one type of error more than the other, look at the confusion matrix at the end. Um, I mean, sure, think about what score you want to use, but I just kind of picked this a little arbitrarily. It just seemed reasonable, seemed better than accuracy. But uh, yeah, that's really something to think about when you're, when you're done and kind of getting close to a final model. And, and I think the confusion matrix is a really good thing to look at for that. Thanks. No worries. So let's take our break and resume at 1145. All right. So um, how much time do we have left? OK, I think we're OK on time. Um, that's good. So now we're going to talk about averaging. So this big idea of ensembles um, is combining multiple classifiers, like I mentioned earlier. And so here we had this bunch of classifiers. Well, this is kind of a mess, but we had logistic regression, decision tree, random force, XG, boost, all those things. Um, and what we can do is there's something in scikit-learn called a voting classifier. And what a voting classifier does is it actually takes in um, a bunch of other classifiers. And what it's going to do is it's going to use all of them. And then it's going to combine their predictions with a vote, hence the name voting classifier, um, to get its own predictions. And so it is a classifier in the sense that it has fit and it has predict and it has score. But when you call fit, it's calling fit on all its constituents. And when you call predict, it's calling predict on all its constituents, um, et cetera. So yeah, so the things inside here could be base classifiers or they could be pipelines like we have here, et cetera. Um, and I want to draw attention to this hyperparameter, which is pretty important. Um, so when voting is hard, it when you ask it to predict, it makes each constituent classifier called predict, and then it actually votes, you know, all in favor, all against, then it, then it actually votes. Uh, but when you call, call voting uh, soft, then when it needs to make a prediction, it actually takes predict proba from each of its constituent classifiers um, and, and combines those. And that's kind of nice because then instead of just saying who's in favor, who's against, you get to kind of take into account how confident each model is. And if you believe the confidence scores, then this is better. If you have nonsense confidence scores, then this could be uh, worse. So yeah, in this case, I'm going to use soft. Um, and so what I'm going to do here is I'm going to call fit on this averaging model, which is again, the scikit-learn voting classifier. Oh dear, oh, I need to run this cell. It's always that panic when you see the red stuff. Okay. Um, I'm calling fit. So it's actually calling fit on six different things. Um, and so it's going to take a couple of minutes. Um, and just a side note here that we actually gave it six classifiers that were already fit, um, but it feels the need to call fit again, um, even though that was maybe not necessary. Okay, so now I'm going to make, I'm going to predict on test example number 100. I chose test example number 100 because it happened to be one of the few fraud cases and so it'd be more interesting to look at. Um, so we're going to predict on, on test example number 100 and it predicts, what is going on with my random seed today? Why is it? Oh, well, something, something's out of whack with my random seed. I picked this test example because it would be a, a fraud case. So now I'm a little confused. Um, and also the scores earlier were, did I change my chain test split or something? Let me, um, sorry to bother you with this, but okay. Let's go with, A 
I just want to pick one that's positive because more interesting. Sorry about that. Um, Okay, that's interesting. Um, it's actually very interesting. Sorry, I think this is worth me figuring out if you'll just give me one minute. Um, okay. So this is a fraud, uh, this is an actual fraud case, number 1600. Um, and interestingly, um, the averaging model is actually getting it wrong. And when we look at the votes, it seems like only logistic regression is getting it right. Um, and all the other ones are getting it wrong. And so in the vote here, it's who's in favor? Well, logistic regression wants to vote fraud. And these other five models want to vote not fraud, and so it's voting not fraud, which is why PREDICT returns uh, not fraud over here. Um, and so this would be if you had voting equals hard, uh, because the hard voting, it's just literally, this is calling PREDICT for each classifier inside of the averaging model, and it's just doing a vote, one, zero, 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 okay, you vote zero. So with soft voting, um, it looks at, the actual scores. And so uh, this is very interesting. Um, here, did I, did I run out of this? I guess I did. It's a little mysterious to me, uh, but logistic regression is very confident that it's a fraud and all the other ones are very confident that it's not a fraud. And so it's averaging all these probabilities on the left, averaging all these probabilities on the right, and overall, it's saying, um, as a whole, I'm 80% confident it's not fraud and 20% confident it is fraud um, because it's, it's averaging these. Can this be a result of all the tree-based models overfitting? Um, it could, but I'm a little worried there's just like a, a bug here or something that I'm missing because I'm very surprised that it's different from when I ran it yesterday. Um, but I did call fit, so... I think maybe it's just a weird case where logistic regression knows better. Um, so if I were to call predict Praba, by the way, on the entire averaging model, then what we'll see uh, is that we're getting these exact same probabilities. So see, if I call predict Praba on the voting classifier, it says, well, I'm 80, 20, and that's the exact same numbers that we manually got here by calling predict Praba for each classifier inside which was this table and then taking the average of each column and we got this. So this is to demonstrate that that's how the averaging model is actually working. Uh, and because voting is soft, it's looking here and it's saying, well, 0.8 is bigger than 0.2, so I'm gonna vote not fraud. Um, it's yeah, also worth noting, yeah, so we haven't talked about it too much in this course and I do plan to talk about it later, but um, predict Praba is kind of its own beast um, that, the, these things look way too confident. Um, all of these things look way too confident. And someone asked in the chat, is it because they're overfitting? It is related to that. There is kind of a, a relationship between a model overfitting and a model being way too confident. Um, and, and that's something we'll talk about more later in the course. But yeah, I mean, decision tree is the most ridiculous in that it actually returns 100% confidence. And in general, the probability scores coming out of decision tree are not really to be trusted. Um, okay, let's keep going. So we can see how this model performs overall by just doing cross-validation on the averaging model. Um, and so this is, think about what's happening here. There's quite a lot happening. So it's splitting the folds. It's getting a train fold and a validation fold. For the train fold, it's fitting all those six classifiers and then predicting all of that. And then one of them is even a pipeline that is even fitting the scalar and transforming and then fitting logistic regression, then predicting on the validation fold for each one, getting those probabilities, averaging them together over the six things, 
and then taking which one's better, and that's one prediction, and then it's doing all that, um, and then it's computing this average precision score, which is some can of worms. So all that is to say that there's a lot of stuff going on here, uh, and to really get our heads around, like, it's not a lot of code, but it's a lot of, of stuff happening conceptually, and we're going to even go one level deeper in a minute. Uh, but, that, but yeah, I'm not too upset that this is taking a while to run if I think about all the complexity of what's happening under the hood here. Not to mention that Cat Boost itself is super slow and doing something complicated. And so that's probably the main thing we're waiting for. OK, so this random seed thing may mess up my punchline, um, but that's OK. So um, my punchline, as I was running this last night, is that uh, the ensemble classifier actually did better than all the other ones. And I wonder if I changed the random seed or something, and that's why everything's a bit different today. Um, but yeah, we can see they're very close. Um, and I'm sure you can believe me that in some cases, the averaging classifier is actually going to do better than all of uh, the constituent classifiers. And, and, and that was true for me yesterday. And so what I want to talk about is, how is that even possible conceptually? How could an average of a bunch of things be better than even the best one? Because if you think of it in terms of the best one, it's like taking the best one and now combining it with five things that are worse than itself. How could that make you better at, at predicting? It's like, I was, I was really good. Now you're just combining me with worse things and that's making me better. That's super confusing. And so that's what I want to talk about now. Um, and kind of the intuition for that super confusing, unintuitive concept, I, I put together this little table. So imagine you have three examples, so three credit card transactions. And for the first one, logistic regression and random forest predict it correctly, but cat boost predicts it incorrectly. So if you're voting, you have two saying the correct thing and one saying the incorrect thing, the vote is going to take the majority and you're going to get it correct in your ensemble. And now for a different credit card transaction, logistic regression and cat boost get it right, but random forest get it wrong. Again, you're going to vote a majority and you're going to get it right. And then likewise for the third case. So what this is showing here in this kind of thought experiment is that each of these base classifiers, excuse me, are only getting two thirds accuracy. Logistic regression is getting two out of three, random forest getting two out of three, cat boost is getting two out of three. But if you combine them, you can get something better than all of them if they make mistakes on different transactions. So if you combine three literally identical classifiers, then they're all going to say literally the exact same thing and averaging them is totally pointless. You might as well just have one of them. But if you have some diversity in your classifiers, then averaging them can actually make it better than even the best one. It can make it better than all of them. And going back to random forests from earlier today, that's basically how random forests work. And that's why they have randomness because of what you're seeing here. You need the base classifiers to be different for the averaging to be useful. And that's why random forest needs to inject some randomness in each decision tree so that they are different from each other, so that averaging them together is actually useful for something. And so looping back to that. Um, and by the way, I'm using the word averaging here to basically mean voting. Uh, we talked about the hard and soft voting earlier. But next week, we're going to get into regression, where the thing you're predicting is a number rather than a category. Um, and then you're literally averaging. Like one predicts 7, one predicts 9, one predicts 11. You're actually averaging those and get 9. So um, that's why the terminology averaging. But for today, for classification, it basically means voting. OK, I would like to add a Q&A here. We'll see how we're doing in the chat. Um, I see a raised hand, but I think that might have been from before. Uh, but if that is a new one, let me know. Um, OK, we talked about that. Um, OK. Wait, it's all just math. Um, is there any benefit in weighing the results from the different classifiers differently? I am not paying 
this person to say this? Um, that is a beautiful question because that is the next thing we're going to do uh, in, in about five minutes is we're going to talk about weighing the different classifiers differently. Um, excellent question. How does averaging break ties? Yeah, I don't, um, well, okay. If we're using voting equals soft, there's not really any ties because it's actually combining the predicted probabilities and there's no, no real chance of getting a tie. But uh, for the actual voting, I don't know. That's just whoever made it decided that it's random or it just takes it in Python sorted order or whatever. Um, we give the classifiers some weights. Yeah, so we're going to talk about that in a minute. Um, why would changing a random seed cause such drastic difference? Well, um, that's a great question. It, the answer is the difference is not drastic. So if you look at this, this is 71.8 and this is 71.7. So just a tiny perturbation could change the order of these three. Um, if it was like 80% and then changing the random seed changed it to 70%, that would be extremely worrying. And that would mainly just happen if you had a very small data set so that the randomness had a huge effect. Uh, this data set's not that small. And as you can see, the difference is actually very small. So it's basically just luck. Could the average model also do worse than the best model? Absolutely. In fact, that's what's happening right here. Um, interesting. Someone's getting, someone's getting, um, Yeah, so maybe the maybe the randomness um, is having a bigger effect than I thought, and I'm going to look at that after class. Um, one thing that I'm not doing here that I should be doing is uh, looking at the scores from the different folds of cross-validation, because that's going to give me a sense of how different um, or how much can I trust the cross-validation score, which is also something you did in your homework. So um, yeah, let me add a to-do for myself. Cool. And also, it's awesome just to hear that some of you are running the code at the same time. I'm always happy to hear that some people are doing that, although uh, you don't have to. It's totally optional. Okay, so, um, well, it wasn't that amazing today, but um, this, this generally um, does a pretty good job. But so why doesn't everyone do this all the time? Um, and so one answer is just the slowness of the code. I mean, doing six classifiers takes longer than just doing one. There's a reduction in interpretability in that, again, next week we'll talk a bit about, so why did we get this prediction? And if you just have to look at one classifier and think about why, that's a little easier. But if you have to think about six classifiers and why and how did they combine and why, it's just more layers and more complicated um, to understand. Um, the third issue is code maintainability. So um, there was this Netflix prize, I don't remember, maybe 10 years ago that they posted a million dollars for who could improve their movie recommendation system. Um, and it, it went on for a long time, I don't know, a year, and someone finally won the prize, improved it by 10% or whatever what the requirement was, got their million dollars. And sadly, Netflix basically just threw away their code. I mean, Netflix put up this million dollar prize in order to get something better. But in the end, the thing that was better was an ensemble of a million different things. And the code was such a mess that they couldn't really use it. They couldn't really maintain that code. And so there's really some human aspects in here when making these decisions. Should I do this? Should I do that? Um, and we can't just, I mean, I know I sound like a broken record, but it's not just all about CV score. Um, it's can I deal with this code in a year or if someone leaves and that we hire a new person or whatever. Uh, those are important factors. So uh, when can I do this? Yeah, you can combine totally different classifiers. Another thing you can do is you can combine uh, the same classifier with, with itself but with different hyperparameters. So you could combine um, like a logistic regression with a low value of C, with a logistic regression with a high value of C, et cetera. Um, okay. I'm seeing some heckling in the in the chat. Um, don't know exactly what that's referring to, but yes, I did not take 110. Um, okay, so next thing we want to talk about is stacking. 
Oh, wait, did I? Oh, I, I skipped a QA. and a um, Let me look through here. Uh, I think we got most of them, actually. So yeah, let's keep going. So stacking is what someone asked earlier, which is, well, um, can we give different classifiers different weights? And so stacking actually goes one step further than that. And it says, I'm not just going to use different. Um, oh, I see. Got it. OK, wasn't directed at me. Thank you. Um, so, so stacking goes one step further, and it doesn't just take a weighted average necessarily of the different models, but it actually says, I'm going to use those outputs of those six models or however many, the six classifiers, and train a meta machine learning model whose inputs are the outputs of our classifiers. Um, and I'm going to use that and do machine learning on that and stack it on top and make a prediction based on that. However, by default, in scikit-learn, the stacking classifier uses logistic regression as its meta classifier. That has nothing to do with the fact that we put in logistic regression as one of the base classifiers. We can put in whatever we want, logistic regression, random forest. But on top of that, there is a logistic regression. And we saw earlier in the course that logistic regression is taking basically a weighted sum of the inputs because it has like the coefficient times the feature plus the coefficient times the feature. And so if you're using the default stacking classifier, which by default uses logistic regression as the meta classifier, then it is more or less what we just said earlier of taking a weighted average um, of the inner classifiers. Um, so, okay, I'm going to do some demos. I'm going to remove cat boost because it's too slow and, and I just, we can't wait too long for the code to run. Um, and so I'm going to make this stacking classifier from scikit-learn. I'm going to pass in everything except cat boost. Um, and then I'm going to call fit. Um, and so my understanding of what's going on here, again, we're just getting more and more and more levels deep, but stacking model has like cross validation built into it. Um, usually we call cross val score, cross validate, randomized search CV, and those do our cross validation. But this thing itself has cross validation built into it, even when you call fit, because it needs to have a split so that it can train the base classifiers like our XG boost and then have them predict on the validation set so that it can train the meta classifier on those inputs um, on the validation set to, to get the meta classifier trained. So, um, yeah, many, many levels deep of things happening here. Uh, and you can take a look at the documentation for more details. Um, but I'm going to keep going here. So now I have this, this test example, which was 100, and we changed our mind to 1600. Um, so, OK, OK, OK. Um, so this one's still getting it wrong. It's, in fact, even more sure about the wrong answer. Um, and so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the general cross-validation score of this stacking model. And this is going to take a bit of time to run. There's just so many loops within loops within loops within loops here. Um, so it's going to take a bit of time to run. Loops and splitting and splitting within the splitting and pipelines and all that kind of stuff. But I'm going somewhere with this. Yeah, great comment in the chat. I think that this is getting kind of crazy. Um, this stuff actually works. That's why I'm showing it to you. But there are these human trade-offs here. Um, and so it's very good for you to know about these things. And if you're in a situation where you need to squeeze out that last amount of performance, this might be the best thing. Um, but you have to invest your time the, the code maintainability issue, the interpretability issue. And so again, it's basically a human decision about whether to make that trade off. Um, let, let me take a look at the chat while this is running. Um, great question. The output being used in this case is from predict proba. That's correct. So uh, the inputs to the logistic regression are the outputs from predict proba 
from those base classifiers. If it was just feeding in the zeros and ones, it wouldn't be a lot of signal for it to go on. It would just have like zero, 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 one, and you have to use that to predict, but the predict proba output is richer output to act as input to the logistic regression. Okay. Um, I don't know if that's even very good compared to what we had before. Um, what did we have before? Sorry, scrolling. Oh, the best before was 71.8. Um, and now we got 71.9. Yeah, I wouldn't really trust that 0.1 difference at this point. Um, I think that's clearly within the error margins of cross validation. If we looked at the five folds, uh, we'd probably see a variation that's at least that amount. Um, okay, so um, let's keep going because there's a very exciting diagram that I want to show you. I want to make sure I have time to show you. Okay, so again, I'm uh, here's the predicted probability for each classifier. Again, there's kind of and a weird thing happening that I'm going to investigate more after class where logistic regression disagrees with everything else. Um, and what's cool is that you can look at the, the meta model here is logistic regression, and we can actually look at the coefficients of logistic regression. And so here's what it's saying. This is really cool. I'm kind of nerding out here, but uh, these are the coefficients of logistic regression. Remember, the logistic regression doesn't have the 20 columns from the credit card fraud data set, the features, the inputs to the logistic regression are the output of these five things. And so as far as the logistic regression is concerned, there's five features in the problem that it's working on. And that's why there's five coefficients, one per feature. And if I match these up for you, so I'm just printing it out with the name associated with it, you can see how much it's trusting each one. It's not really trusting decision tree as much, which makes sense because the decision tree is the worst one here. It's trusting XGBoost the most, um, and 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 uh, so on and so forth. So I think this is really cool, um, getting to look at these coefficients. And um, I want to show you something else that I think is even more fun. Uh, logistic regression is the final model, is the meta model by default. Um, if you look at the documentation final estimator. Um, the default is a logistic regression, but you can, you can set this to whatever. And in fact, that is what I'm about to do. I'm about to set the final estimator to be a depth three decision tree, not because this is necessarily a good idea in general, but because it's going to generate us a really cool picture. So I'm doing the same thing now. I'm making the, the, meta model, a depth three decision tree. Um, I don't know if it's even worth waiting for this to finish because uh, I'm not going to bother with this because I think it takes like a few minutes and I don't want us to spend all our time watching the code run. Um, so I'm going to fit this meta model on our training set. And so again, it's fitting all these other things and then it's taking the outputs of those and feeding those into a decision tree. And then what I'm going to do when this code is done is I'm going to make my display tree function that makes a picture of the tree, which is actually going to make a picture of the meta model this time, um, which I'm grabbing from here. And so we're going to take a look at what the meta model looks. And that's why I picked depth three so we can make a picture out of it. Um, and yeah, here's what it is. And I, I, yeah, you may or may not agree, but I think this is so cool because we can see that the meta model it's saying, is the pr probability output of random forest less than 0.195? Okay, if so, let's look at the logistic regression. Is it less than 0.99? Um, then, then let's go over here and look at the random forest. Is it less than 0 0.055? Or if this was false, let's look at the XGBoost. I mean, 1.0, this must be like a rounding thing. It's probably like 0.999, because um, it's always going to be less than 1.0. Um, and so on and so forth. So I think this is really uh, fun to look at. And you know what I'm seeing here is that it's saying if it's less than something, predict one. And if it's more than something, predict zero. So what that's telling me is it's actually looking at that first probability column. It's looking at the probability 
for the, the zero class, the not fraud class. And so it's saying if the probability of the not fraud class is low, predict fraud. And if the probability of the not fraud class is high, predict not fraud. Um, because remember, predict proba outputs those two columns where they, they add up to one. Um, and so it seems to be looking at that first column here for any of this diagram to make sense. Um, yeah, so again, I think there's some rounding error here with the number of decimal places. There's no reason to check 0 0.999 twice. Um, I, if we plotted this to more decimal places, then we would see something that made more sense. Okay, five minutes left. Um, oh, I just want to say an effective strategy I, I have heard um, word on the street. So it, it seems that uh, something that often works for people is to randomly generate a bunch of models with different hyperparameter configurations. So kind of like randomized search CV, but not for searching, but you know, basically just generating a bunch of random models with different hyperparameters and then stacking them all together. Because again, what's so cool about stacking is the meta model is going to learn which of the base classifiers are reliable. Whereas with voting, if one of the base ones is garbage, it still gets a vote as much as anyone else, which might not be that great. Um, but with stacking, it's basically learning these coefficients of how much to, to trust each one. Uh, and so that seems to be a pretty popular, pretty popular approach overall. Um, FYI. Okay. Q and A. Um, yeah. So I think there's nothing here that needs to be addressed immediately. And there's some references that I'm missing clearly, but I'm just going to move on. Um, okay. Hey, we're actually going to end on time. That's great news. Um, so what did we do today? Um, first, we talked about a bunch of different classifiers. So, so far in the course, we only really talked about logistic regression and decision tree, but there is a world of classifiers out there. That's not what this course is really about. Um, and I don't think it would be a good use of your time for me to just go through a million classifiers and go look at the documentation with you. Um, but these tree-based classifiers, FYI, are super popular and effective. And so, like my personal recommendation, if you're working on a classification problem, is do dummy classifier, do logistic regression, and do some of those tree things as like your first pass before you do anything else. Um, and I think that's going to be a very good start for, for what you're doing. Um, Sometimes we need to leave scikit-learn and we're going to leave scikit-learn again later in the course when we talk about computer vision, natural language, um, survival analysis, those kinds of things. Um, so yes, scikit-learn doesn't have everything in the world. Um, ensembles are usually pretty effective, uh, but there's this trade-off between code complexity and code speed for potentially better prediction accuracy um, and especially stacking uh, it's kind of slow, kind of complicated, but generally gets good accuracy. And it, you know, it should usually do better than the ones inside of the stacking because it gets to decide how much to trust them. Uh, so, you know, if only one of the classifiers is good and the rest are horrible, it could just set a coefficient of one to the good one and zero to the other ones. Uh, and it'll basically just use that good one. So, um, yeah, another thing to mention, I didn't do hyperparameter optimization today, but imagine you have the stacking classifier and then you just do this massive hyperparameter optimization where you're optimizing the hyperparameters of all the things inside. Like that's another loop on top of the, I don't know, five nested loops that we're talking about by now, because keep in mind the inside of fit, there's at least another loop for the fitting process. Um, but that gets the job done. So that's the reality we live in. But you can imagine how code starts to get slow when you have loops over, over I don't even know, over the data set, over the folds, over the fitting, over the stacking, over the hyperparameter optimization. It's really a lot of computation happening here. And honestly, it's super cool that um, like a, a regular laptop can actually do that these days. And then finally, um, remember that everything we've done um, and, and we kind of learned some of these lessons today by accident, 
because I reran the code and got a different order of which one was best. And so what I should have done is I should have looked at the folds of cross validation and said, well, this is, you know, 71 plus or minus one, and this is 71.1 plus or minus one, and that's not like a real difference that I can trust. Um, and so I was a bit complacent because I thought the data set was big enough, but when, when the differences in scores are so small, then you can't necessarily trust the ranking. So I'll look into that later. And after class, I'll also look into that true or false precision accuracy thing that I made a mistake on earlier today. Um, and yeah, that is it. We're out of time. Have a good weekend. Enjoy the long weekend. Enjoy homework four. And I'll see you back on Tuesday.